Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach and teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level, to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. We've got a fascinating episode for you today. We live in pivotal times, at the crossroads on the cosmic timeline for humanity and our planet. Yes, yes, I know, this is a worn-out statement, we hear it pretty much everywhere in various iterations, but we can't ignore it as it is true. Still, I hope that you will hear something new in this conversation where I explore with my guest a link between our consciousness and our immediate environment, Mother Earth, and show that the expansion of our awareness of the Earth as a living conscious being, is imperative and directly impacts on our future. Not only that, this impact is a two-way street. This is not a hierarchical step-by-step process, but an evolutionary spiral dynamic of our consciousness and behavior with fluid movements up and down, back and forth, yet generally in an upward progression. And also, Importantly, we will look at some tools and strategies that can help us in this process to thrive in these turbulent times, to find peace in the eye of the hurricane. My special guest today is Michiel Dorn. Michiel is a practical mystic, author and teacher, with a Master of Science in Engineering from Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands He's had a thriving career in environmental science and technology. As an adjunct lecturer at North Carolina State University at Raleigh, Michiel designed and taught classes in environmental ethics and sustainability. Michiel is fascinated with the correlation between our natural and cultural environment and our human individual and collective evolution and how they are constantly shaping each other. In his work, from the big picture perspective, Michiel is helping people make a leap in the cosmic conscious awareness to overcome eco-anxiety and navigate more easily through these turbulent times. He has just published his third book, The Cosmic Lens, A New Perspective for Thriving in a Disrupted World, which we will be talking about. You will find more information about Michiel in his work, including links to his online presence and his book on my podcast website at quantumlivingpodcast.com. Hello, Michiel. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you, Anna. It's totally my pleasure and an honor. I'm very excited to be here because um, I am passionate about the message that we uh, hopefully can get across. And I uh, also know that you are just as passionate about bringing the voices and the wisdom that is needed in these times. So um, this is what we have in common. And I certainly hope to add other perspective, a very urgent perspective, I think, uh, to help uh, humanity take the next leap. Absolutely. And I'm looking so much forward to our conversation. Okay, so to begin with, could you please tell us a little bit about your personal journey from an environmental engineer to practical mystic, speaking about the quantum aspects of life as one integral system? 
Was it a personal or professional awakening? I think it really was a personal uh, awakening, Anna. I was the only child and I was born in the Caribbean. So I spent a lot of time outside in nature, not wearing shoes. I also had a pretty vivid uh, spiritual uh, imagination at the time. And I think I just started forgetting then when I got older. And um, when um, it was time to go to college, I actually chose uh, geology first. So there was something in the back of my head that said, hey, Earth, geo. And then to make things worse, I switched to mining engineering. So I uh, really can now look back at my life and see how I got absorbed in the culture and um, the way uh, I thought I had to be. And that um, was a number of years, a couple of decades, and then I started reawakening again. Um, and for me, uh, what really came uh, up is the question, why does Earth and even why does the universe exist? And also, why do we as humans exist here on Earth? So what, what does that mean? What is this role? And I think that is the crucial question of our times. And that has been driving me in, uh, in my work. Lovely. Thank you. So we'll be talking about quite a number of issues surrounding this topic. So to lay the foundation for our conversation, what are the main dangers and challenges do you think we are now facing as a species and as the inhabitants of planet Earth? And of course, we must keep in mind that if we destroy our planet, we will destroy ourselves. Yes, um, it is a very serious uh, topic. And let me say first that um, at the end, I also see a tremendous hope because of the way I sense that the universe or the divine operates. So first of all, the planet, planet Earth, will be just fine in 200 or 200,000 years. It is uh, us. And from a scientific perspective, all global indicators are pointing in the wrong direction. And I'm talking about climate disruption, uh, species loss. Think of insects, insects we need for pollination, species diversity, but also water quality um, and so on. And there are certainly many smaller initiatives all over the world of people doing wonderful things, starting an organic farm or whatever it is, education. But here I'm talking about the global indicators, and they're all getting worse. So to really answer your question, uh, there are two ways uh, to look at this. First, the three-dimensional, our world, scientific uh, perspective and the sociological perspective, we can expect massive suffering and loss of lives. We will see more and more collapsing nations and may go back to a type of Somalia where warlords fight over the spoils. And this is political, it's war, but often, if not always, this is also related to resources, to drought, to water, to population. So it's not wise to see it separately. So the earth will be fine at some point, but what we are losing beyond the suffering is also the natural magnificence and our cultural magnificence. We will also lose Mozart or Japanese ceremonies or whatever speaks to, to people in their culture. It's also under stress and it's going to be gone. There's actually also a more metaphysical, cosmological way to look at this. So why does the Earth exist? Well, for me, it is that um, God or unity has to create. 
out of that unity came duality. And part of that duality is the manifestation that we are part of. And also, uh, we, we, we find it back in the, in, the, in the literature. We talk about Father Sky, Mother Earth, Yang and Yin. Interestingly enough, matter, material, and mother have the same root. It's actually really interesting linguistically. To me, this manifestation, this creation is just as sacred as that unity love. It came out of it, so it is also sacred. And a final point here is um, my hypothesis that this planet is actually a really important classroom for souls. When we are here, we think, wow, it's so stumbling and we're such little children here. But I have a sense that it is actually the opposite, that it is quite difficult for souls to take on physical form. So spirit has actually quite an interest in this planet, in this experiment. And yes, in the big picture, it's all fine, and God doesn't really care. And But it, God also cares about this planet, because there is this tremendous opportunity to learn for, for well, souls, if you will. At this point, I would like to bring into our conversation your latest book, The Cosmic Lens, A New Perspective for Thriving in a Disrupted World, which has a second subtitle, Seven Steps to Handling Uncertainty with Grace and Co-Creating a Livable 21st Century, which you co-authored with Dr. Bridget Field Book. Could you please tell us about the strategy outlined in this book, how can we thrive in a quote-unquote disrupted world by looking through the cosmic lens? And I would also propose that the cosmic lens concept you wrote about in your book can be also seen as what I call the unity triad, which is about asking ourselves this question, is it good for me? Is it good for others? Is it good for the greatest good? The planet, humanity, the universe. <laughs> so I'd like to invite you to please speak to that strategy and the key messages in your book, Cosmic, The Cosmic Lens, and whether you concur with my proposition about the unity triad. Yes, thank you. I'm so Happy you bring that up because this is the leap we have to make as um, humanity or as critical mass. And personally, I've given up on critical mass. I don't need to define it. Uh, one person can change the world. So that's a detail. But the leap is that we um, don't look anymore what's good for me not even what is good for humans, but that we now do as best as we can, what is good for the further unfolding of all of life. And that is exactly what I hope to express in the book. And um, we've, we've already covered some very complex topics and um, it's okay if we stumble, let me say that first. Uh, so, so the book is also very much um, a translation to make it more palatable, to make it a little easier, because these are such heavy topics that it is, um, it's, otherwise you, you don't sell a book, you put it simply. So I want to draw people in. I want to invite them in. So that's why I also give practical steps. And um, 
What I do is I give process steps. I don't give do this, do that, buy solar panels, uh, filter your water. It's already out there. We know all that. So I, I don't say anything about that. So very simply uh, summarized, um, it's about thriving and succeeding. Well, succeeding is not a good word. Thriving and living in that new world. So what is important is to um, start getting that these are systems, that they are connected. And the cosmic lens helps with that. It's actually a metaphor to see those systems. It's a story. There's a story in a book and it helps people say, hey, yeah, I never thought about that, you know. I see how that is connected. But the flip side, as within, so without, is to highlight the cosmological laws and principles. So I, of course, I did not want to go with religious principles of some religion or of... Um, humanitarian principles. And they all have a place, sure, and they can all help people. But I de deliberately chose the cosmological principles. And what I, what I mean is as within, so without, um, what happens to one happens to all, uh, laws of cause and effect, as in karma, which is usually multiple causes and multiple effects. So, what is really interesting is that a lot of these age, age old uh, laws actually reflect in the ecology, in the system science. So I gently introduce those two in the book. Uh, so these are, these are translated into steps. And I think we can be quite um, hopeful and empowered if we learn how to deal with um, uh, accepting change is the only constant, is another law, and um, working with these principles, with these laws, instead of trying to fight them. Uh, it's, it's, it's over, you know. Um, politicians say, well, we offer job security, or we offer this security, or that security, or there are climate uh, zones that are not affected. I'm afraid that's just not true anymore. So the better, the faster we learn how to uh, surf and flow instead of swim against the stream, the better off we are. And, and I think that um, also offers hope because that's the way forward in my uh, view. Yes, so what I'm hearing is that there are strategies such as expanding our consciousness beyond our own life and even our community or nation to the global scale, if you like. And by doing so, working with it, and we'll come back to, to that point in a moment, in a way that will help us overcome the growing stress, anxiety, uncertainty about our future. Because one point that is really useful for us to understand is that the first thing we need is something to hang on to. We need to have something tangible. And it's not only hope for the better future, but signpost, if you like. And for many people, this is religion or spirituality. And in your book, what you are proposing is that if we can apply certain strategies and follow certain steps, like signpost that we can hang on to and actually work with, this will help us because, well, let's face it, no one really knows the future, okay? <laughs> we can predict, we can run various scenarios, which obviously all scientists do. We can look into the future psychically, which again, many people do. We can do remote viewing. So we do have mechanisms, if you like, which are both scientific and spiritual. But in the end of the day, we don't really know the future. And the reason why is that everything happens here and now. So if we can change our mindset and our understanding of how life works, which is incidentally what I'm teaching in my programs, 
how life really works. This will allow us to bring in the most desirable future into the now, because that's the point where we can experience it. There is nothing outside of it. So having concepts that explain how life really works and give us tools and strategies to, in a practical way, to implement them in our life, to have something to hang on to while we are being in those turbulent times that you speak about in your book. That's really, really helpful. Yes, it is. And um, I agree with you mostly. Um, I think uh, we both agree that reality and uh, can change in the blink of an eye. It can. And um, I also believe that on this planet, we do have time and space because that enables us to learn. But for God, there is no time and space. So it's true. There are these realities that can overlap or however you want to call that. Well, in times like this, stories and metaphors are uh, very uh, helpful. We need we need a new story. We need new stories. The stories from the 80s and 90s and don't work anymore. So I interviewed uh, a lot of thought leaders for um, this book. And one said, we need to learn how to navigate with a compass instead of using a map or a plan or a route. That's a really beautiful um, metaphor. And also, we, we can learn um, how to read the weather more carefully. We can prepare better. So those are steps people can take that um, are actually not, not all that hard. Um, the, I think the big secret, going back to um, here and now and reality, well, it's not a secret. It's actually also such a cliche, cliche word after that movie. We have tremendous power in focusing our thoughts, our intentions, our words. And if we do that while being inclusive of uh, all of life as best as we can, then we can change reality. And uh, if that's going to be um, just my reality, yes, that will change. But that is also old school already. It, life, what happens to one happens to all. So we have to start thinking in that bigger picture. So we have to um, be very, very clear on our choices and responsibilities, our thoughts and our intentions. And I believe choice is a, the key principle of, of life and of, human, of human, humanity. Having said that, there always is a choice. And that gives me tremendous hope, even if it is in what I radiate, what I put out there. So there is where our power is. So there is no more book to hang on to uh, or flag or um, whatever. It is this deep trust and this knowing that uh, even in the face of hardships, we do have power. We can decide how we uh, respond with compassion, sometimes tough love or, you know, but that, that to be able to give that to people is, uh, I think, what uh, will really help them, especially in uh, these times, because otherwise they kind of collapse to survival. And then um, it gets much harder. Absolutely. In your book, you mentioned a very interesting concept 
called spiral dynamics, which I find personally fascinating. Spiral dynamics is a symbol, a metaphor, and a model that we can apply at the individual and collective levels to assist humanity in moving on to the next level of consciousness and evolution. And what is really beautiful about it, which reflects life, is that this is a two-way street. So in other words, it's not only how the environment is impacting us, but also how we are impacting the environment. It is a complex concept. But because it is so relevant to our conversation, I would like to ask you if you could please give us a brief <laughs> overview of this model and possibly, if you can, a couple of examples where this model was applied, maybe at the either individual or community or global level, just to show us how this works. And then I would like to invite you to speak to the training program that you actually offer on spiral dynamics. So what is spiral dynamics? How does it work? And why is it helpful and useful? Yes, thank you, Anna. So spiral dynamics is a super handy model to um, look at how people and also cultures and organizations develop and how they evolve. And what uh, the model does, it looks at uh, value systems and it has like eight value systems identified. So that is how people make meaning. That's how what they find important in life. The dichotomy, the duality you were describing, that is exactly right, because the life conditions that people find them in, the stress, the, the fa failures, or maybe even the abundance, uh, influences how they uh, make meaning and find value inside. And if that doesn't match anymore, um, they will have to, they can either collapse, they can go back to survival and back to fighting, which we unfortunately see quite a bit of uh, these days, but also um, they can evolve. So um, this model was um, developed in the 60s at first, and go, I won't go into details, but there are these levels and or stages, but they are like... Um, reverse peeled onion. It's not that one level is better than the next level, and that is totally unhelpful, but there is almost as if there is a layer of complexity, a layer of consciousness and awareness added each time. And it shows that there are these distinctions between these levels. And um, they are, um, to make it easier, they are labeled with um, colors. So the first one would be survival, which is also babies or drug addicts. Uh, the next one is the tribal, per we call it purple, the tribal system, which is still pre-ego. So people do everything in um, service of the tribe. That is what is important. And there is a tremendous belief in spirits and connection with nature. But when that became stifling, um, and you would have like priests like wanting to influence everything all the time, people broke out. So the next level is um, what we call red, which is raw ego. It's really in here and now, it's Harley Davidson, I'm going to do what I want. So very individualistic. And that's another characteristic of spiral dynamics. It goes back to communal, community, to individual. So it spirals back and forth. And the next level we call the blue is the fundamentalist uh, level. It's the beginning of understanding of uh, cause and effect. And um, it... Um, is um, the old-fashioned family uh, 
fundamentalist churches, um, and very importantly, all these levels can have a positive expression, but they can also turn negative. Because even in a, a fundamentalist church, there can be a tremendous amount of support and love and so on and so on. And there can also be a very, very negative uh, situations, as example. After that, um, we get another individual level, which we call orange, which is... Uh, let's go and strive and make money and be successful. And so that's the, the capitalism. And, and that's a really helpful level if we want to start a business, if we want to uh, succeed. Uh, but now for the same token, that is also um, a value system that is uh, not helpful anymore. It is overbearing. It's eating up everything. Um, it's very clear, you know, when they use the word resources instead of nature. So that's all orange. Then there is the green system, which is the egalitarian system. And uh, it uh, is a community. It is a women's liberation. It is uh, inclusivity. It's also a deep dive into the own psyche, the psychological. Uh, it's respect for nature. But then that can also become stifling because people sit around in groups all the time and um, don't get anything done where they want to have everybody agree and that's just not going to work at some point. So um, then there is the yellow system, which is um, the first uh, value system that starts to understand how all this works. And that's really interesting because um, the other systems always fight with each other. And you can see it in political parties, maybe not in the U.S. because it's hidden into two parties. But in other places, you can see, oh, this is a green, this is an orange party. So and you have to be careful. You always have to be careful. You have to know why uh, people do what they do, of course. But yellow doesn't fight uh, with any of these anymore. And uh, then we got, get the turquoise system, which is the whole earth, the whole view, the whole world view. And that is where we have to be now because of what we have talked about. So um, to um, be very quick, uh, yeah, I do give uh, two hour online trainings and I'm certified to do that. Um, I don't do whole weekends because I'm not certified to do that. <laughs> but I uh, can reference the SDI, Spiral Dynamics Integral. So sdifoundation.com. And uh, I would recommend them. I know the people personally. And I also want to put out a warning that so many organizational firms and coaches and oh, they, they they use this, but they they make it flat. They they make it too simple and they misinterpret it. So I can recommend the foundation. And there is also a Facebook group which is open, and it's called Beck after Don Beck Beck Graves. Graves was the founder. Beck Graves Original Spiral Dynamics. It has 3,000 members. You can just start uh, looking around if you want to know a little more about it and start following the discussions or making contacts. Does that give you uh, a brief enough answer? <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. And could you just again tell us in a nutshell how can this model be useful when applied, let's say, in a corporation? How can this model assist an organization or a company, a corporation to grow, to evolve? How an understanding of this model can help in the transition process? Yeah, thank you for that. And indeed, I uh, hadn't um, 
mention that yet. So I think it is uh, absolutely helpful in understanding where people are coming from in their in their values. Uh, because on the outside, you can't see anything, you know. Uh, but if you ask a couple of questions and you're aware of these uh, stages, you can um, get a better picture. It's almost like Myers-Briggs, you know, or whatever. But you can get a better understanding. And then you can tailor your communication in collaborations or, or coaching or even sales situations. So if you meet a green person, you uh, don't say orange words. You don't say, oh, you got to win. You know, this is going to bring you success. This is going to help you kickstart uh, and boost your career. No, that's off-putting. But you say... Uh, you know what, with your colleagues, you'll be able to create a wonderful working environment where everybody can contribute. And they go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you know, you can reach people where they're at. And um, the best example or the most beautiful example is from Don Beck himself. He worked... Um, South Africa is still a miracle that that never had a civil war. Don Beck was one of many people that helped. He worked with uh, Nelson Mandela and the clerk with the spiral dynamics model to um, see where these groups are at and make the values healthy. So get the anger out and uh, not get them to be equal, because that would never work, but to get them all in their own dignity and uh, thereby create that new nation. I think he made 40 or 50 trips to South Africa at the time. So that's just the biggest example. But um, um, I use it in my book to translate, uh, to reach people, to be inclusive. And one of the Tricks is people read what they feel attached to. So if you make a combination of keywords, um, they pick up on that. So that's how people can use this, uh, this model. Or organizational consultants can use it, coaches, like I said, and so on. Now, when I was looking at that model and the, the six and eight altogether tiers or levels of values, there was one particular that caught my attention and it stands out somehow and I will explain why. And that is the purple, which is the second level called magical animistic, which started about 50,000 years ago. And the basic theme of this level is keep the spirits happy and the tribe's nest warm and safe. So this is the, the first level where we see connection with the spirit world. Yeah. And really integration of our physicality with non-physicality, which then as we move up through those other levels, pretty much disappears. <laughs> And a couple of observations I have made when looking at this model is that I feel that there is currently a resurgence of the purple consciousness at the higher level on the spiral as a nostalgic longing for the magical place alive with spirit beings and mystical signs. So we are sort of coming back to that, to that level but at the higher level of understanding. And this is marked by the so-called New Age era. And it is reflected in the books and movies we feel so strongly drawn to, such as Avatar and Harry Potter, just to name the two most obvious examples. We want magic. 
we are longing for mystical, for that non-physical, paranormal, as we call it, which essentially is very normal to us, taking us through the veil between our physical and non-physical or spiritual existence. There is also a dramatic increase of people engaging in esoteric practices as part of their daily living, such as astrology, meditation, witchcraft, shamanic tradition, divination, mediumship, channeling, energy healing, and and many others. And by the way, I talked about it in my recent episode on mysticism in the quantum age. In parallel, I would suggest that there is the ninth level of human consciousness emerging, and it reflects in a crystal color, which is pure white with silver sparks of light in it. And that is the alchemistic merging of science and spirituality. At this level, we explore our spirituality and understanding of the cosmos through the lens of quantum physics and rejoice like little children when we find esoteric teachings explaining the various concepts in a way that we can validate with science. So I think that these two relatively recent and new trajectories of our evolution as human beings impact on every aspect of our life. What are your thoughts? Hmm. Well, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, You hit the nail, the very important nail on the head. That is uh, that looking at the purple uh, wisdoms, we have to do so now from a higher level of understanding. And this is also the trap of certain new age. We cannot go back uh, to that that time and we cannot step into the shoes or skin of these people because they um um like i said they were pre-ego well we're, we already have our our ego so what we um purple does not get enough attention i agree with that in in the model which can be quite uh, brainy um Rituals are important, and they still exist. Uh, Look at Santa Claus for children. That's purple. Uh, Rituals in uh, Catholic or Anglican church, uh, you name it. Um, Bar mitzvahs. These are all rituals that are, in a way, purple. They bring to that community. They they bring that coherence. So um, as long as we uh, look at uh, healthy expressions and... um, use the perspective of a higher understanding, we should definitely use um, or engage with or invite these these wisdoms. Um, also, purple had human sacrifice, you know, um, because they thought that was the ritual to appease the spirits. Well, I don't think we want to go there. As far as the next level, um, I'm not sure if I uh, know or would agree Um, as far as the model, it's open-ended, and which is actually, I think, a sign of wisdom when the inventor, quote-unquote, inventor of the model says, I don't know what's going to happen. It's open. Um, But... um, I think turquoise already has uh, this whole Earth's perspective, which is on the outside, the systems, the ecology, the climate, uh, supply chain, internet. And on the inside, it is the numinous quality of the Earth of which we are part. So that is already beginning there. Um, Yeah, um, I think it's a really good uh, uh, focus to have this crystal light. Does it fit in the model right now? No. 
uh, is it uh, a good uh, good thing to envision? Yes, um, certainly. So, so I would leave it uh, leave it at that. I think for now. <laughs> Yes, and especially the focus of that ninth level, as I as I see it in my mind in this crystalline light color, is that nexus of science and spirituality, because in my mind it goes beyond and above the current turquoise model, and because it is so very recent, and I absolutely agree with you and with the creator of the model that it is open-ended because as we mentioned earlier, we don't really know what the future brings. We are creating our future as we go, moment by moment. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that anyone should include the ninth level, <laughs> but I just wanted to to put it out there to consider in the scope of the broader conversations and, and where we are going. People keep asking, okay, what's beyond quantum, what's beyond artificial intelligence, what's next? We don't know, so we can only speculate in this space. Now, Michiel, given your professional background, I'd like to talk about a highly emotional, controversial and divisive topic <laughs> of climate change versus environmental sustainability and protection. As these concepts are being often confused, hijacked and exploited as a political, economic and controlling tool by many, to the point of brainwashing and using some young people who are simply passionate about their life and the future, training them and setting them off as very aggressive activists. I won't name any names, who don't understand what they are talking about because they are just too young and too inexperienced and simply follow instructions. And if some people don't see this manipulation behind the scenes, well, I suggest they take a closer look at what is really going on. So I'd like to get on my soapbox, if you like, here for a moment before I ask you to comment on this topic. Many of those individuals I briefly mentioned, governments, groups and organizations, deliberately disguise the key difference between these two sides of the coin, the eco-coin, if you like, of our planet, for their self-serving agendas. And the key difference is simply this. Climate change and environmental protection are two separate sides of the coin. They are both integral to the healthy future of our planet and humanity, but they are at the same time completely separate and do not touch. And here is why. We have zero control over the Earth's climate change and we have a total control over the environmental sustainability and protection. I say it one more time. We have zero control over the Earth's climate change and a total control over the environmental sustainability and protection. The Earth's climate change is a cyclical phenomenon governed by its own evolution and position in the universe, and has been for the past four and a half billion years. So no matter how hard you and I, and collectively as a species, could be puffing and huffing to stop the next ice age, for example, it won't make one iota of difference. The ice age will happen when it is supposed to happen. So do, and so will, temperature fluctuations, changes in the Earth's magnetic field, including the reversal of its magnetic poles, and many other elements of the quote-unquote climate change. So I think we shouldn't be even talking about the climate change, but about the environmental sustainability and protection of this planet that we are the custodians of, 
stewards of, not the owners, but custodians and stewards, because this will absolutely impact on our life and the lives of future generations. And without getting too technical, in my view, there are three biggest dangers we are now facing in this space. One, uncontrollable deforestation, especially in the Amazon, which is the lungs of the planet, combined with extinction of many species. Two, uncontrollable natural resource exploration and mining, which disrupt the Earth's energy meridians, thus the flow of energy, which has huge impacts in its own right, amongst other things, disrupting the equilibrium of the delicate ecosystem we are an integral part of. And three, uncontrollable pollution. And I'm not talking about CO2 emissions, because this is a separate topic. It's a, it's a big scam in its own right. And this is not the main issue here, as many influential people want us to believe. But pollution with waste of all kinds, including nuclear, pollution of the oceans, killing the marine life, etc., etc., etc. Okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. <laughs> and ask you for your comment. Sure. As an expert. Yeah, as an expert, um, I hear you. Um, I think um, we um, have more impact than uh, you would uh, uh, describe here. Um, I love it how you also talk about the Earth meridians and other energy within within the rocks, if you will, within the mountains. So that is an important aspect uh, that I normally don't think of. Yeah, pollution is a tremendous problem, especially microplastics now. Um, we even have them in our blood now and they're everywhere, and it's a mess. The Earth does a lot uh, about uh, changing itself, but um, I do believe that as humans, we also impact that and influence that. Spiral dynamics actually is really helpful here because um, it's not just the value level and level of of perspective taking and meaning making where people are at, they cannot see beyond that. Um, so um, what you get is that uh, you, you cannot talk about ecosystems with people that are have a center of gravity at red or at blue. They don't understand it. They just see separate objects. They do not see the system. So the communication becomes really important. Um, I think uh, when we uh, talk about being very powerful in our choices, there is no denying that we can also be very powerful in making bad choices that affect the whole earth. So that is probably where you and I differ. Uh, I know some of the scientists and I'm read the science, and I am qualified to read the science. And um, the greenhouse effect is real. Um, I also think that um, with our comprehensive and more compassionate uh, uh, embrace of life, we can change that. Um, the young people part, I don't know. I can't speak for them. Uh, and I do know that Generation Alpha and Generation Z, they're not stupid. Um, they may uh, know uh, more than we think uh, they do, some of them. So I think that's one vision. Um, they um, also know that um, they most likely are going to have less than their grandparents. We always used to think everything gets better and better all the time. I think they know that uh, that is not the case. So I would give them uh, some space to be angry. 
and yes, um, it gets be gets hijacked for politi political reasons. Unfortunately, um, when it comes to um, the science, we need to stick to the science. And uh, what you and I um, try and work on is to bring in um, uh, a spiritual, mystical, metaphysical uh, viewpoint, um, which is um, needed, um, but which is also, of course, uh, very uh, easily hijacked or misinterpreted. Yet, uh, I think... Um, that is the work you and I are doing in our own ways. And that is uh, what uh, bonds us. Thank you. But what I would like to find out is, and I'm very curious <laughs> about it, what is your view on my point, on my key point, that climate change is separate to environmental sustainability and protection, and that we have no control over the first one? but total control over the latter. What is your position here? Yeah, that is a good point. I think we uh, I totally agree with the second, that we have total control over environmental protection. Um, as far as climate change, there are massive cycles, but uh, scientists actually take these already into account. And they add on what it is that uh, humanity with greenhouse gases and CO2 is only one type of greenhouse, greenhouse gas uh, can be adding to that. If there is a bathtub that is almost full, if somebody throws rocks in it, it can still overflow, even if the bathtub is a massive thing of itself. Um, so yes, there are Earth cycles, but I do think we can um, and have been influencing those through our unconsciousness. Okay, thank you. So, Michiel, what would be your final thought to wrap up this conversation? I want to highlight my, um, put my mentor in the spotlight, Thomas Berry, and um, he wrote a uh, short poem that I think is very um, pertinent to our discussion. So I want to close with uh, honoring him and also because I love this poem. It is called Earth's Desire to be seen in her loveliness, to be tasted in her delicious fruits, to be listened to in her teaching, to be endured in the severity of her disciplines, to be overwhelmed by the wonder of it all. Beautiful, and what a pertinent and beautiful closing of our conversation. Thank you so much, Michiel. It's been a pleasure to be speaking with you on Quantum Living. My pleasure, and thank you so much, Anna, for making this happen for the world, for us, and for life. Thank you so much. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.